Uh, good morning. My name is David Andalfaro. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. We're here at the uh, uh, St. Louis Fed's annual conference, the 38th annual conference. I'm here with uh, Professor Michael Woodford of Columbia University. Uh, Michael will be presenting a paper, or has presented a paper, in fact, uh, with the title Conventional and Unconventional Monetary Policy with Endogenous Collateral Constraints. Uh, sounds rather technical, but Michael has agreed to sit down with us here to uh, explain to us what his paper's about, kind of why the uh, research question is interesting, what his findings are, and what potentially uh, the policy implications of his work are. So thank you very much, Mike. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the question that your paper is addressing? Well, the question is one posed by uh, dramatic changes in monetary policy, particularly in the U.S. in the last few years, although to some extent um, uh, on the part of other central banks as well. And that's been a switch from monetary policy being about deciding on the level of short-term interest rates, the federal funds rate here in the U.S., to instead focusing on the Fed's purchases of assets, various types of um, long-term uh, treasury securities or, or agency-issued securities. And that's been a very important change. Um, it's raised a lot of questions about what exactly the Fed is doing, playing as big a role suddenly as it is in buying different types of assets and many more assets than it used to. And there hasn't been a lot of uh, economic theory developed to explain what that kind of policy would be about. There's been many decades of discussion of what central banks should do with interest rate policy and what effects it seems to actually have on the economy. This new tool has been much less studied, although under pressure of the emergency, central banks have been experimenting in a big way with, uh, with these unconventional policies. And our paper is you know, trying to uh, begin at least a discussion within economic theory of how we can understand the new tool and how it's similar to or different from traditional interest rate policy. Right. So, uh, of course, there are theories out there, uh, not fully developed perhaps. There are con 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 a conventional wisdom of how these tools might work. Uh, can you uh, explain to us uh, the findings of your own research, how they might uh, um, corroborate these findings or these beliefs or go against them in some manner? Is there something surprising that emerges from what you've discovered? Well, I, I think so. I mean, I think a lot of the um, discussion that you see of, of the point of asset purchases suggests that there should be a lot of similarity between the effects of purchasing long-term assets and the effects of uh, cuts in the federal funds rate, the Fed's traditional tool. People say, well, the whole point of cutting the federal funds rate is uh, longer-term bond yields would also go down, and if you can uh, just buy longer-term bonds, push up their prices, uh, that's doing the same thing with a different mechanism, and so you know it's a different way of doing the same thing, and if you can't cut the federal funds rate further, then there's an obvious reason to use um, the other method. And our analysis suggests that this analogy between the two tools is not, um, uh, not nearly as strong as, um, as you might have expected. And, uh, Why is that exactly? Well, one reason is that um, the question of uh, whether it's clear that um, Fed purchases of longer term assets can affect the prices of those assets as directly as traditional interest rate policy would. But I think the more surprising thing is that our analysis suggests that even under circumstances when the central bank finds that its purchases do affect the market price of the longer term assets, the connection between that and spending in the economy and then the effects on inflationary pressure are not necessarily at all similar mm. to those of, um, of, of conventional interest So you're interest suggesting rate that uh, it is possible, at least in theory, that uh, uh, the Fed uh, engages in a large purchase of a certain class of assets, kind of injects money in the economy by purchasing a particular class of assets, and that this may in fact have the very exact opposite sort of effects that conventional theory right, might suggest. Right, right. We, we, we clearly show that that's at least a theoretical possibility. And obviously then deciding 
you know, whether you think that's actually happening is another, is another thing, but, but I think the analysis points out that you shouldn't assume that the mere fact mm -hmm. that you could raise the price of the bonds answers then the question about what effect you're having on the economy. What would, so can you explain the economic intuition for that effect and, and whether or not it has some bearing as to the conduct of Fed policy today? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think the point is, is a fairly simple one, and it has to do with the question of why, uh, why the central bank purchases should be able to move the market price anyway, which again, you know, I think people thought was kind of obvious. They said, well, if you're buying more of something, surely mm -hmm. that'll um, tend to make it more expensive. But when you ask whether that should actually happen uh, with a lot of sophisticated traders out there in the market that are also trading against the central bank, what we argue is that if the other traders in the economy aren't constrained uh, in the financing they can mobilize to take the positions that make sense for them, they will tend to automatically have an incentive to trade against the central bank and to neutralize then the effects of the central bank's trades. The case where that won't happen is if the people who would have to have an incentive to trade against the central bank are financially constrained. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, uh, people who would be needing to um, wish to shift out of the particular kind of assets that the central bank is buying uh, aren't able to reduce their exposure to those kinds of risks as much as they would like to, you can have um, the market valuation changing. But what, hap what may very well be happening is then you're forcing, in fact, parts of the economy to bear types of risk that they don't want to. You're, you know, you're pushing them up I more see. tightly against uh, against their financial constraints and saying that that's a victory because you're changing market prices. I mean, okay, you're doing something, but you have to ask whether you're doing something that's making the financial markets function more the way you want them to right. or um, making financial constraints have even more perverse effects because they're constraining people even more. So correct me if I'm wrong, ways. though, but the, the so-called financial constraints that you're uh, uh, alluding to here, uh, they, they have to be present even in, in the case where the, uh, the uh, Fed intervention has the kind of the conventional effects on the mm -hmm. economy. So it's not immediately clear to me uh, what, what are the circumstances that distinguish uh, whether or not the purchase, uh, the uh, Fed, Fed purchase of the assets kind of makes things go in the right direction or kind of makes them go in the opposite or unintended direction. What's, what's, what's the distinguishing characteristic between those two cases? Well, I think, you know, what our analysis implies should be looked at more is the question of who you think is financially constrained and how much they're financially constrained and whether the uh, more important case is whether there are people in the economy who would like to take on more of a certain kind of risk and are currently being prevented from taking on as much of that risk as they would like to because of their financial constraints. And perhaps the central bank then taking on that risk and then indirectly causing people in the economy to bear it, whether mm -hmm. they're voluntarily doing it through their own portfolios or not, is helping them to take on risks that they would have liked to take on themselves, or whether it's people who would like to reduce that kind of risk are prevented from reducing their exposure to a certain kind of risk because of their financial constraints, and by forcing them to take on more of it, then you're pushing them in the opposite direction to where uh, they would be moving if their financial constraints were reduced. So that's interesting. Now, do you think that there's scope for uh, central bankers kind of in real time to, uh, you know, take the lessons of your mo model, uh, of your theory, to uh, tailor their activities, their interventions in the economy? Uh, I guess another way of asking the question well, is, I mean, are you largely in favor of uh, the large-scale asset purchase program that the Fed is currently undertaking? Uh, does your, your Does your theory have any Thing to say about that in particular? I mean, the main thing it has to say is I think it would encourage caution about, about plunging <laughs> further into the, um, uh, the policy as far as we have without more investigation of, uh, of what it's supposed to achieve. Uh, 
in general, I mean, our analysis would say that simply looking at whether you think you can move the market prices isn't at all uh, an adequate basis um, for conducting the policy. And on the question of who's more financially constrained, I mean, that is something I think should be looked at when considering the policies. I don't think it's been uh, uh, too much a focus of investigation, but something that our theoretical analysis implies is that even if you had uh, more people constrained in their ability to take on more risk of a certain kind, and you would be helping them have more exposure to that kind of risk through the central bank purchases of a certain scale, if the central bank continues taking on more of that type of risk on its balance sheet, as that policy proceeds, it becomes more and more likely mm -hmm. that the people who are the relevant constraint is on the other side. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who would like not to be exposed as much to that kind of risk and are you know, not going to be able to reduce their exposure to it. And so uh, I think the further you would go with asset purchases of a particular kind, the more reason you would have to be concerned that the, um, uh, that the, you know, the effects are more likely to be on one side than the other. Right. Um, you talk about uh, Fed purchases of risky assets. I mean, do you have in mind uh, some loose connection of the Fed's purchase of the uh, mortgage-backed securities, the agency debt? Yeah, I mean, I think that the um, the argument that's been made you know, for the desirability of the Fed asset purchases is the idea that certain types of risks are going to be taken onto the Fed's balance sheet with the idea that exactly taking certain types of risk out of the portfolios that people in the private sector have to hold themselves is going to make an important difference to the pricing of, of, of risk in the economy. And so the whole idea that you're concentrating certain kinds of risks on the balance sheet of the central bank, I think is entirely the theory uh, behind what's going on. It's not just an accidental effect. Um, and so then you have to ask, what do you think that does? And I think it's, it's a mistake to say, well, the central bank just takes the risk away. I mean, it doesn't take it away. Uh, it, is, it can affect who is, in fact, going to be bearing the risk, um, because it's essentially it means that a public institution mm -hmm. is going to concentrate its holdings of a certain type of risk, and that means all taxpayers together jointly are going to have no choice about uh, bearing certain risks, and the question is whether you think that concentrating the risks in that way is facilitating an allocation of risk that was in fact desirable and that the markets would have been achieving themselves through voluntary trades if financial constraints hadn't been impeding it, or whether you're thinking you know, you're bringing about an allocation of risk that people would have liked to trade away from if financial constraints weren't keeping them from doing it, and you're you're pushing them even further into a corner they don't want to be in. Very good. So uh, I guess last question would be in terms of, well, if you were chairman, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> the Federal Reserve, uh, what sort of policy or policy um, intervention would you be favoring at this time? I mean, just endowed with the situation as it's developed to this point. Um, yeah, does your model or even outside your model, what's your feeling just of how say, uh, Yellen, let's say, if she goes forward as uh, our choice, uh, what sort of policy recommendations would you be offering her? Well, I mean, it, it's obviously a very, a very complex situation, <laughs> and I, I, I'm glad it, if it's her, uh, glad it's someone like her rather than me, I mean, having to, <laughs> uh, having to make those decisions. In general, I wish, um, you know, the Fed were speaking more about uh, the need for fiscal policy uh, to take on more of the burden of, of, of trying to get the economy moving. I think that to some, I'm afraid that to some extent the Fed's um, desire to stress the fact that we still have tools, we haven't used all of our ammunition, I think the intention of that is to reassure the public. Mm -hmm. the, the, the feeling is that letting people be scared that maybe we're out of ideas would itself create uncertainty about the future that would be undesirable for the economy, and that's understandable, but I worry that it's had the undesirable effect 
of letting Congress off the hook a mm -hmm. little too easily by letting them say, well, you know, the Fed right. still has lots of things they can do to take care of the situation and, um, you know, so we can play other games. And uh, I think, you know, maybe the Fed would have helped the public debate if it had pushed back a little more on the view that everybody should be assuming the Fed will save everything. Interesting. Well, if you had to summarize your paper, the mm -hmm. results, the findings, can you give our audience a, a brief takeaway? Well, I mean, again, it's, it's not a paper that claims to have given a, uh, anything like a complete analysis of, of the situation that we're currently in. It's more an exploration of um, uh, some important, I think, some important considerations and how they're connected to each other. But I, um, I think at least one of the more important things that comes out of it is the suggestion that even when asset purchases might have useful effects, that one should ask um, how far you think you should go with them. Because um, even in the cases where there are beneficial effects of shifting some risk of a certain side on the central bank's balance sheet, it definitely doesn't mean that then shifting more and more of it uh, can only be better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think there are real questions about how far you would want to go down that path. So some may be good, but more is not necessarily better. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate it. Thanks.